Thank you, Mrs. Spenkut, for your kind words of introduction. Um, Mrs. Ruland, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'm very honored and happy to be here today. And I'm grateful to speak the keynote for the opening of this conference. When I was first asked, asked I thought it a real challenge to answer the question. How will digitalization change the face of the higher education landscape in Europe? Well, I'm still thinking it is a challenge, but uh, since that time I have been reflecting upon it and I would like to share the results of my reflections, which are in fact a simple introduction to what will be at the heart of the discussions and works today. When talking about uh, the higher education landscape in Europe, the main subject remains, of course, the Bologna process. The story starts in 1998 with four countries, Italy, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, signing the Sorbonne Declaration, and it goes on the following year with 29 education ministers agreeing to pursue the convergence of their systems in order to facilitate institutional student exchanges and the mutual recognition of degrees and periods of study in Europe. Today, the European Higher Education Area, EHEA, involves 48 states as shown on the map. What lays exactly in the Bologna process? Mainly three key commitments, con mainly the Three key commitments concern the implementation of the three degree cycle structure, bachelor, master, doctorate, the recognition of qualifications, and the quality assurance. Without reminding the whole history, I'd like to go back to 2015 and the Yerevan communique. In addition to the implementation of the these commitments, the priorities of the Bologna process thus set out are learning and teaching, social inclusion, and employability. Ministers also pledge to continue to foster mobility and internationalization and called for attention to the value of the EHEA. In May, in um, 2018, the education ministers met in Paris and adopted a communique on their priorities for the coming years. It all outlined the joint vision of the 48 ministers for a more ambitious European higher education area beyond 2020, calling for an inclusive and innovative approach to learning and teaching integrated transnational cooperation in higher education research and innovation, securing a sustainable future for a planet through higher education. The community calls for stronger, better support for underrepresented and vulnerable groups to access to and excel in higher education. It is, of course, full consistent with the aims of the European Commission, which works with the EU countries to strengthen key competencies needed by all for personal fulfillment and um, development, employability, social inclusion, and active citizenship. Furthermore, Long life learning is a must that needs ever more digital competencies. In 26, the Euro European Parliament and the Council adopted the recommendation on the key competencies for long, lifelong learning. It provided a common European reference framework on key competencies for policy makers, education and training providers, the social partners and learners themselves. 
In June 2016, the Commission launched the review of the 2006 recommendation on key competencies for lifelong learning with the aim to update it and further support key competencies development across Europe. The thus given and revised definition of digital competence is both useful and interesting for the two days works and reflection. You can read that, you can see them. In 2006, digital competence involves the confident and critical use of information society technology for work, leisure and communication. It is underpinned by basic skills in ICT, the use of computers to retrieve, assess, store, produce, present and exchange information, and to communicate and participate in collaborative networks via the internet. And in 2016, it became digital competence involved the confident, critical, and responsible use of and engagement with digital technologies for learning at work and for participation in society. It includes information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, digital content creation, including programming, safety, including digital well-being and competencies related to cyber security, and problem solving. The reorientation of the definition is trend-setting with regard to the focal points, lifelong learning, participation in society, and creating digital context. And maybe the two days conclusion will give a glimpse at what will be the 2026 definition, although I'm rather convinced that we maybe aren't able to imagine it yet. What has to underpin today's discussions are the objectives set for 2025 by the, commun by the commis Commissioner for Education, Culture, Youth and Sport, Tibor Navrasic. A Europe in which learning, studying and doing research will not be hampered by borders. A more inclusive, higher education system recognition procedures that ensure mobility, increase and relevance of higher education for a labor market in permanent transformation. And we have to find ways to unlock the potential of the EHEA and reach the following objectives for the 2018-2020 as set in the Paris communique a three-cycle system compatible with the overarching framework of qualification of the EHEA and first and second cycle degrees scaled by ECTS, compliance with the Lisbon Convention of the Qualifications Recognition, quality assurance in compliance with the standards and guidelines for quality assurance in the EHEA European higher education era. And while aiming at these goals, one has to keep in mind the complementary objectives of the other summits related. On the one hand, to the education as the first European education summit that took place in Brussels in January 2018, because before coming to higher education, young people have to be educated first. And on the other hand, on the labor, to the labor market and the needed skills, as a follow-up to the social summit in Gothenburg 2017, because that's what they will have to join in FINE. And of course, these topics are not independent, but wholly intertwined and interconnected. Digitalization, of course, is a wonderful and powerful tool to help achieving these goals. We only have, have now to determine, to determine how, will, how digitalization can help to achieve 
the objectives of the Bologna process. When speaking of digitalization in education, one of the first things we think of today are MOOCs. Launched in 2011 at the Stanford University, the MOOCs, massive on online open courses, gave the impression that they would become the most important revolution in the university history since, in, since its creation in, eight, um, eight in, in 2010 in Berlin, according to Antoine Compagnon. The publication of the first MOOC was perceived in the USA as an opportunity to tackle the crisis of the higher education due to rising teaching costs and to the stagnant incomes of the middle class. Platforms were quickly launched, such as Udacity in the USA in 2011, and in Europe, Coursera in 2012, and Edix in 2013. Some MOOCs are free, some aren't. All certifications are paying ones, but the fees ra remain rather low. On the one hand, MOOCs can respond to a democratic ideal by making possible education, higher education, and lifelong education for anyone at any time and everywhere, thus meeting with some of the Bologna process commitments. On the other hand, learning thanks to a MOOC requires a computer, high-speed internet, and good learning methods. One can thus consider MOOCs as a way to make significant profits thanks to an intensified competition among students and universities, and thus MOOCs could also strengthen worldwide education inequalities. Indeed, a study led by the University of Pennsylvania in 2013 shows that 80% of the subscribers to its online teaching offer were already graduated students. A few disappointments later, opinions had so evolved. The revolution would be slower and probably not as inclusive as first imagined. The fun platform France Université Numérique was launched in France in 2014. Its operating principle is to offer free training to users. Fun's economic model is mainly based on the financing of the state as well as on the contribution of its members and the additional service it offers. Certification, exam monitoring. Since then, numerous French universities have created MOOCs available on this platform. But in Europe, I have to say that the Polytechnical Polytechnic School in Lausanne has become the main MOOC provider and has reached more than 2 million subscribers to its online offer since 2012. The university created um, 81 online courses published on Coursera and Edex, mainly targeting an external audience. 100,000 students succeeded in getting at least one course certificate. A single MOOC corresponds to a course at the university. Currently in Europe, there is no program or degree offered that is based on MOOCs. But this may be one of the challenges of the digitalization, of the digitalization in the A EHEA and what will change its face? Whole programs or degrees on MOOCs? Indeed, MOOCs can contribute to strengthen the mobility in several ways. When taken in a university in a foreign country, it gives an international experience with regard to the language or the way of teaching. Thus, it is a virtual mobility, as you said, for students that cannot travel. Furthermore, it can be used as a preparation for a real mobility, thus facilitating the success to the, of the stay abroad. 
The preparation can consist in language, in language training courses. Erasmus created the online language support platform and or in specific subjects in accordance with the chosen curriculum. Let's cite here the example of MOOCs for Credits, the virtual exchange between the EPFL and its partner universities in France, Australia, the Netherlands, and China. With offers that are flexible in space and time, universities can reach those who want to study part-time, those who are less mobile, for example, because they are single parents or care for someone, people who want to further qualify themselves in addition to their profession. So far, digital education has tended to benefit those from parental homes with an affinity for education. It should not remain that way. Considering social inclusion, the emergence of fab lab, learning labs, and virtual labs can contribute to a more outward-looking university and to share competencies and knowledge with society in general. Moreover, digital contents could also be a mean to, for a better gender equality. It is well known, for example, that some scientific or technical subjects don't seem very tempting to girls. The reasons are numerous and lay in the societal messages as well as in a misrepresentation of them. Digital tools could be a mean to get girls acquainted with these subjects in a less intimidating manner and let them discover that they can be very interesting, even fascinating, and that they are able to succeed in them. It is well known, too, that careers in young children's education and childcare do not attract so many boys. It lays in prejudices on these jobs and how men are supposed to contribute to society. Let's hope that digitalization will allow information on these careers beyond their traditional target groups and thus enhance gender diversity in these professions too. I spoke of enhancing the student mobility and its success. It is a chosen mobility then, but digital tools can also help for the forced mobility and help the integration of refugees in many ways, language, level, evaluation, and so on. A major issue as well as commitment in the Bologna process is the recognition of qualification and periods of study. The Diploma Supplement is a document accompanying a higher education diploma, providing a standardized description of the nature, level, context, content, and status of the studies completed by its holder. It is produced by the higher education institutions according to the standards agreed by the European Commission, the Council of Europe, and UNESCO. The Diploma Supplement is also part of the Europas Framework Transparency Tools. This map shows the stage of implementation of the Diploma Supplement in the year 2016 and 17. Four criteria are considered. If the Diploma Supplement is delivered automatically, to all students free of charge and in a widely European spoken language. As a conclusion, and as you can see, the implementation is pretty good in all the countries of the EHEA, except Belarus, which was an issue and a topic of discussion in the late conference in Paris. It is then obvious that the next step should be its digitalization. A digital development of the diploma supplement could help solve the current implement implementation issues across the EHEA. 
according to a recent study, the diploma supplement could be digitalized incrementally, building upon already existing and widely accepted solutions, so that the EHEA countries could apply the digital diploma supplement solution at their own pace. The digitalization could reduce recruitment process costs for jobs, could foster accreditation and validation of the documents in recognition, and increase security standards for student data. So what could, what could change? The colors on the map. We should look forward a monochrome map in a fifth color for the implementation of the digital diploma supplement. Digitalization of the diploma supplement would also contribute to the quality assurance within the EHEA, which is a key commitment to the, of the Bologna process. As a matter of fact, quality assurance should ensure a learning environment in which the content of programs, learning opportunities, and facilities are fit for purpose. At the heart of all quality assurance activities are the twin purposes of accountability and enhancement. Taken together, they create thus trust in the higher education institution's performance. A successfully implemented quality assurance system will provide information to assure the higher education institution and the public of the quality of the higher education institution activity, this is accountability, as well as provide advice and recommendations on how it might improve what it is doing, this is enhancement. Quality assurance and quality enhancement are thus interrelated and belong to a quality culture, which is a matter of all actors, from the students and academic staff to the institutional leadership and management. They support mutual trust, thus facilitating recognition and mobility within and across national borders. They provide information on quality assurance on the EHEA. After such statements, and given that quality monitoring is a continuous process, I would think that it is completely obvious to all that digitalization will help increasing the quality assurance. It will contribute to the transparency of the processes, the internal as well as the external ones, and it will help comparisons and sharing experience and networking on these topics. The standards and guidelines for quality assurance also state that higher education aims to fulfill multiple purposes, including preparing students for active citizenship, for their future careers, contributing to their employability, supporting their personal development, creating a broad advanced knowledge base, and stimulating research and innovation, her whole program. And digitalization has applications and consequences in all these fields and points of view, whether it is for the best or for the worst remains to be determined, and that is what I propose to discuss now. Digital technology is a lever for rethinking and renewing pedagogy in line with the overall transformation of society and the economy. It challenges the verticality of knowledge transmission in favor of transversability transversality and implies rethinking content in favor of the student's profile and needs, which constitute the entry point of the pedagogical approach. One can individual, individualize training pathways on large scale to enable all groups in training 
to organize more easily entries, refresh our courses, or to mobilize additional resources and give the possibility of tailor-made courses. It can also allow the composition of microcurricula and certificates as part of national diplomas or of institutions. Increasing online offer provides also to students a chance to better match their study with the demand of the labor market. Some universities have shown, chosen a hybridiz hybridization form, which means that the inscription in a training that can be carried out in various time periods and according to the path chosen by the learners thanks to the combination of the distant and the face-to-face. -face. The validation of the modules of trainings and skills can then be anticipated. It is also likely to be accelerated with the capitalization that also allows for additional certifications or even facilitating double graduation. It can also be extended under for long life um, learning. Among pedagogical innovations, flipped classroom are made easier by online contents and can enhance the pedagogical monitoring quality. Grenoble Alp University, among others, has introduced with success flipped classroom in the first two semesters of medicine studies to tackle the problem of overcrowded rooms. And they did it with success. But flipped classrooms where the lectures are replaced by video and online contents and where students have the opportunity to ask questions about these contents and to take part to a course devoted to a specific part of the lecture that they don't master have also given good results to tackle the problem of low attendance rate and high dropout rate in other subjects enabling the, the university to face the increasing number of applicants without increasing its budget in the same proportion. The success of flipped classroom or of small provide online classes shows that online contents cannot be a systematic substitute for teachers. Online teaching should not deprive students of mediation, learning methods, educational support in any case. Online pedagogic has been challenged by the public opinion as well as in universities. Opponents claim that there is a risk of a two-speed two higher education system with face-to-face -face teaching in a few well-off institutions and online teaching in universities meeting budgetary difficulties or having low student population. First of all, it must be clear that going digital has a financial cost, but it is also a chance to improve the quality of our higher education. The digital transformation of universities implies a new organization of learning and teaching, new facilities, other competencies to increase some expenditure and to reduce others. For these reasons, it is necessary to anticipate the budgetary management of university at the digital area and on the long term and to rethink a way to budgetary sustainability. Such a reconsideration of university's economic model should allow more ambitious objectives in terms of digital transformation and pedagogic innovations. To be efficient, the development of digital educational innovations should correspond to a strategy of the institution clearly described and supported by a plan, as in Australian universities, for example, instead of the dilution of responsibility observed in France, for example. 
Since the digital transformation has not been taken into account early enough and as a whole by the budgetary policies in many European universities, many different tools have been developed, and developed or implemented one after another, such as Moodle online enrollment platforms, shared agenda, etc., resulting in an abundance of online services and a useless redundancy of their functionalities. The promise of was that digitalization would make campus life easier for everybody on it. And the result um, is the, this one for students. For example, lots of applications which are redundant. So, well, it shows that improvement is the, in the matter is possible, I should say, necessary. As a matter of fact, rethinking the economic model of universities should allow the finan financing of a comprehensive, efficient, and online platform for services and to students, staff, researchers, and teachers. Change in management requires significant support from both teaching teams and students. Therefore, it is likely to question the teaching profession itself. The notion of coaching and mentoring tend to replace the notion of teaching. The need to produce fully open educational content is sometimes experienced as a strong constraint, a form of imposed quality assurance. The individual dimension of the act of teaching is erased in favor of pedagogical teams. Another important aspect is to take the students' needs into account. Students should be more strongly and systematically involved in the implementation of the digital transformation in, in, of institutions. E-learning is an integral part of the teaching at the Freie Universite in Berlin, for example. The university supports the use of digital media and technologies with, among other, other things, an e-learning support program, extensive training and consulting offerings, and a central modern technical infrastructure. A digital transformation must not forget the administration part, so it must be accompanied by measures for the management of the administrative staff. Universities need to make job descriptions more flexible by integrating new professions and allowing for versatility, model the need for new skills in the management of employment and skills and set up a training program enabling existing staff to acquire and update the skills required by the digital educational transformation. The European project iMotion supported this kind of initiative. But too often, the lack of an institution strategy results in a lack of financial resource for costly IT projects, as well as a lack of manpower to build its digital future. Furthermore, digital literacy has to be taught at every level and be part of the strategy. An often cited obstacle is that the current staff of the universities do not belong to the generation of digital natives, and thus the digital university does not come naturally to them. But digital literacy doesn't only consist of being comfortable with digital tools and reaches far beyond that notion. Digital natives are not systematically digital literates, and this is also a challenge for a digital university. 
taking into account all the financial resources and measures that should be taken, a fundamental question remains how to organize the distribution on a meta level, in other words, not only within the university, but within a state or the European Union, for example. The French approach of call for projects has surely been a success to enhance experimentations in France, but it led to an unequal repartition of financial resources and failed to create a global digital transformation. This incentive policy has probably reached its own limits, no general objective and guidelines. When considering management, the management of the enrollment of students first entering the university has become an issue in the country where their number is increasing every year. And since digitalization makes data transmissions easier, one should consider that this is an opportunity to match the demand and the availabilities. In 2018, the French government set up the new admission system Parcoursup. This system is built to better match students to programs in order to cut France's university dropout rate. Furthermore, the government decided to publish the open source code and its comments for a total transparency of the process. Its early publication, carried out in agreement with the Ethics and Scientific Committee of the Parcoursup platform, is a first in the administrative sphere. The system promotes a full understanding of the mechanisms of the new procedure for entry into the higher education. No, no hierarchy of wishes, absence of constraints, response times which allows when each candidate makes its choice to free places that are immediately offered to other candidates. As Parcoursup makes it easy, also easier to apply for high demand courses across France, students might begin to travel further afield. So, this is an example of how the technical possibilities may make the selecting processes more transparent and more open for mobility. Both goal, goals sought within the Bologna process. The contribution of digital technology is decisive here to enable students in the final year of high school and then the graduate to be fully informed when they make their register registration wishes. The, may, the aim here is to support the orientation with adapted digital tools and data processing techniques. Furthermore, a lot of individual member states have tracking systems, like for example the Alumni Portal Deutschland, a cooperation project promoted by German government, the DID and other organisms. But the goal for the future should to bring together the data and to have more comparable data on the jobs students go into and how well their degrees prepare them. This could be completed by data on the social engagement and what sector the graduates enter. If universities knew which sector graduates of certain subjects were entering, they could update their curricula to ensure students were well equipped for these workplaces as information for students, parents and policy makers, thereby improving student decision making. Such tools change the face of the higher education landscape in each country. Could they also be developed to help the mobility within the EHEA? It seems very complex, but within the range of algorithm designers. On the other hand, coupled with the learning analytics of the students, one could imagine a digital system that would be able to decide of the best curriculum for a student in taking into account all the former degrees and academic results, training periods, what graduate students with the same profile became, and the demand of the labor market. This could lead to wonderful opportunities for the students or, on the contrary, lead to 
to total mistakes, look, locking up students in pathways that don't correspond to their interesting possibilities. We also meet here the issue of the protection of the personal data thus generated. As for the society, this could prove efficient, at least for a certain kind of society. Dangers and traps lay in such a process, especially with regard to the individual liberty. Caution is more than ever necessary before completely untrusting algorithm with the determination of a person's future. Another problem we face with student enrollment is when the student goes abroad. Who in this room has been confronted with the enrollment of a student in a foreign university? Well, then you will understand my dream. Well, one of my dreams. Indeed, one of the best achievements of the digitalization in the EHEI would be a fully numerical student file with all the grades, diploma attestation, diploma supplements, and its numerical transmission from one institution to another, secured thanks to blockchains or other smart contracts, depending on the choices of the student for mobility targets. No more papers, no translations, no copy certifications. A simple sequence of clicks. Don't you think that would change the face of the EHEA? Will you allow me to dream further? As a researcher, I also dream of a unique model of convention ruling the co-supervision of thesis within the whole EHEA. Well, I'm aware I'm dreaming, but why not? Eventually, the, Bro the Bologna process has achieved a lot. The three-cycle bachelor master doctorate system is a given for the European higher education landscape and beyond. The ECTS are used in most of the countries. Qualifications are rather well recognized and common standards for quality assurance are known and used in most of the EHEA. Mobility and internationalization are an evidence in the minds. We know in our everyday li university lives, and because we're in the middle of it, we're also aware that there remains a lot to do. <clears throat> As we've seen, digitalization, digitalization can change the face of the Bologna process and the higher education in Europe in many ways and among them, a broad access to knowledge and data. And I believe <coughs> that thanks to digitalization, the EHEA is undergoing a transformation that may result in what we wish for, making of the EHEA an identified region of university excellence with university networks, networks closely bounded and students, academics, research and staffs circulating from one to another institution. A world region able to keep its specificities and have its own brand and also to challenge the United States and Asia on these grounds. Seeds for it are initiatives such as, because we're in Germany, I have to cite it, the French German University, OICOR, the University of the Great Region, the French Italian University, and more, and coming soon, the European universities, which by President Macron. I am sure that today's discussion and works will be a step further into that direction and I'm eager to participate to them, and I wish you and us all very productive meetings. I thank you for your attention.